Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you guys today is one that was actually suggested to me quite a long time ago, but when I started looking into this case about two weeks ago, there were actually new developments the literal same day that I began researching. This is definitely an interesting case, so I'm really looking forward to bringing this case to you guys today. But before we get into it, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to HelloFresh for partnering with me on today's video. HelloFresh delivers a fresh produce straight from the farm to your front door so you can enjoy all of the delicious flavors that are in season right at the comfort of your own home. HelloFresh allows you to skip that trip to the grocery store, which I'm so happy with because I hate going to the grocery store, and it allows you to spend more time with your family, especially as summer is starting to wind down and we're starting to get back into our normal routines. Plus, they deliver pre-portioned ingredients for every recipe so you don't end up overbuying and overspending. This also helps to eliminate food waste by at least 25% compared to grocery shopping, which is so important to me. I want to make sure that when I'm cooking, I'm not overbuying and I'm not wasting food, which often ends up happening because I never have any idea of how much I should be getting or what to be getting. HelloFresh has so many different meal options that help fit the needs and goals of you and your family. They have veggie, pescatarian, family friendly, fit and wholesome, and so many more. They also have a quick and easy, which is ready in 30 minutes or less for those nights that you want to spend more time with your family and not as much on your meal time. For me, I've never been someone who enjoys cooking. Cooking. My roommates can attest to this. I go for the quickest and easiest options every single time because when I go to the grocery store, I'm genuinely overwhelmed and I genuinely don't know what to cook. But with HelloFresh, they completely eliminate the stress for me, giving me meals that I can make with my boyfriend or my roommates for a little roommate family dinner or a date night with my boyfriend. It's been so much easier not having to worry about what I need to buy from the grocery store and I actually feel like I can cook since all I have to do is follow some directions. So if you want to save money and make your meal time so much easier, make sure you head to HelloFresh.com and use code RachelShannon16 to get 16 free meals across seven boxes plus three free gifts. That's HelloFresh.com using code RachelShannon16 and you'll get 16 free meals across seven boxes plus three free gifts. Thank you again so much to HelloFresh for partnering with me on today's video. So with that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the tragic death of Dr. Ghulam Munda. Ghulam Munda was born on August 10th, 1935 in Gujarat, India. He was born into a lower middle class family, but he was always so intelligent and caring towards other people, so he dedicated his life to helping others. He went to university in India where he went on to medical school as well, but he did so exceedingly well in school that he received numerous scholarships to go to the U.S. to complete his residency. So he did. He left India and he ended up in the U.S. where he attended Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Here, he did his residency specializing in urology. After this, he had gotten married to his first wife. The two of them then moved to Sharon, Pennsylvania to begin his career at his own practice in Mercer County. Here, his practice thrived, but it seemed that his wife at the time didn't like the life that they had in the rural small town area in northwestern Pennsylvania, so they ended up getting a divorce by 1972. By 1979, Gulam, an orthopedic surgeon, and three Three other doctors all formed a partnership and they opened up Highland Medical Group in Hermitage, Pennsylvania. This building was a part of a bigger complex that held multiple other medical offices and here that same year, Gulam met a woman named Donna Smouse. She was young, having just graduated from high school three years prior and at the time, she was working as a secretary in another physician's office. Donna was born on April 9th, 1959 to her parents parents Dorothy and Ross Smouse. She was described as having an amazing childhood. She stated that her father 
mother treated her and her three sisters like princesses. She looked up to her parents as having an amazing relationship, the kind of relationship that she had always dreamed of having herself. She wanted to do whatever she could in life to make her parents happy and especially make her dad proud. Donna had been a cheerleader in high school and she was a devout Christian. She was blonde and beautiful and she was described as being perky, funny, and cheerful and she quickly caught the eye of Ghulam. Now, he was 20 years older than her, and when he initially started to pursue her, she resisted because she didn't want to get involved with an older man. But he was very well off, he had nice things, and he wanted to share his wealth with her. He started getting her expensive gifts, such as a car, and initially, again, she resisted these gifts, but Eventually, he did win her over and the two began dating. As Ghulam moved along in his career, he definitely grew a taste for the finer things in life. He started to wear nice, fashionable clothing, he got expensive jewelry, he drove nice cars, he loved good food, and he had the most beautiful home. However, according to friends and colleagues of Ghulam, he also liked to use his wealth and status for good. Those around him remembered numerous times where where he helped students who were struggling to make a living while they were completing their studies. He volunteered with the sick and the poor, and there were some patients where he would give them medical care without charge if he knew that they couldn't afford it. And he was very active in the Muslim community, so all around, he was just a very well-liked and well-respected person. In addition to helping those in his community, he was also known to be an amazing doctor who showed every single patient kindness and respect. He would greet each and every patient with a smile and hang up their coat for them. He would sometimes give patients his personal phone number and told them to call him anytime if they had any questions or if they needed anything. One former patient of his said, quote, he portrayed a humanitarian quality. I could see it and hear it in the way that he talked to people in the office or the hospital. He was known to remember everybody's names, even if he hadn't seen them in years or even decades. He seemed to just have all of the most important qualities that any doctor should have. Now, after him and Donna had started dating, she did move in to his beautiful home with him. Some people saw the age gap between them and thought that maybe she was just dating him for his money. Now, Donna did go on to earn three degrees. She had a bachelor's in science, a bachelor's in nursing, as well as a master's in anesthesiology, and Ghulam did pay her entire way through school. But those closest to the couple said that they seemed so happy together. She was so absolutely in love with him, and nobody saw any signs of trouble in their relationship. Relationship. They literally seemed attached at the hip and always spending time together. Donna would often brag about Ghulam, how intelligent he is, how accomplished he is, and how lucky she is to be with him. He loved to spoil her, and she loved to be spoiled. The two were together for 10 years before they finally got married in December of 1990. After this, life seemed to be going pretty well for the two of them. Donna worked as a nurse anesthetist, and Ghulam continued in his medical career. They wore nice clothes, and they seemed to live large. And again, the two seemed very happy in their lives, and nobody saw any marital issues whatsoever. The two welcomed to Ghulam's nephew, Farak Munda, into their home after he immigrated to the U.S. from India in the late 1980s at the age of 14. He too wanted to follow in Ghulam's footsteps. He wanted to go to school in the U.S. and become a doctor. Now, Donna and Ghulam didn't have any children of their own, but they sort of took Farak in as their own and they treated him like a son. However, by October of 1998, Donna's father, Ross Smaus, had actually passed away from a brain hemorrhage. Donna was known as an absolute daddy's girl her entire life, and obviously, she was completely devastated by this very unexpected loss in her life. Friends described this event as being the turning point in Donna's life. All of a sudden, she stopped going out with friends and stopped returning phone calls and things for her just were not going well at all. After this, in 1998, 
Donna actually turned to fentanyl to numb the pain that her father's passing had caused her. After this, this turned into a terrible addiction and things just grew out of control for her. By 1999, she had been caught stealing painkillers from where she worked at the Sharon Regional Health System and of course, she was fired. After this, she had to undergo drug counseling and had to do regular drug tests and for the time being, this seemed to work out pretty well. Things seemed to be looking up for her and she stayed off of drugs for quite a while. However, by 2000, 2001 and 2002, Ghulam had undergone two knee replacement surgeries for both of his knees, and Donna said that once this happened, their marriage seemed to just fall apart. She was no longer happy with how Ghulam was treating her anymore, and he stopped being affectionate towards her. So, once again, by 2003, she turned to fentanyl to numb the pain. By 2004, by the age of 44, she was caught stealing painkillers from her work once again and of course she was fired for this and this time she actually had to go to court and she was convicted for theft of narcotics. During all of this, Ghulam stood by her side and he supported her through everything. He spoke with the judge and asked for leniency in her sentencing, so she ended up not serving any jail time. Instead, she was released on probation and had to go to drug rehabilitation. She ended up going to a Gateway Rehabilitation Center in Center Township, Pennsylvania. Here, she grew close with two people. One of them was her parole officer, Chris Sauter, and then another was a 22-year-old young man also in rehab named Damian Bradford. Damian was known by his street name, Chaos, and he had been in trouble for his history of using and selling cocaine in the area. Now, while in rehab, Donna would often talk about how good her relationship was between herself and Ghulam, but employees at Gateway said that this sort of seemed to be more of a coping mechanism, sort of being in denial for the issues that she truly had been facing in her marriage. Either way, Donna and Damien had started a friendship. Donna enjoyed all of the attention that Damien gave her, and eventually, their friendship turned into a physical, sexual relationship. After finishing rehab together in the months that followed, Donna showered Damien with expensive gifts. She bought him a bunch of jewelry. She bought him nice clothes. She bought him a Chevy Trailblazer. She paid for his new apartment, and she gave him large lump sums of cash. Now, after getting out of rehab, Donna actually learned that Damien had a girlfriend named Charlene McFraser, who he had been living with before and after after rehab. Donna had asked Damien for an exclusive relationship with her, but he continued seeing Charlene, and even after finding out about this and knowing that she wasn't going to be his exclusive partner, Donna did continue to see Damien. She also continued buying him gifts. She actually ended up getting him a cell phone as well as herself a cell phone so that the two could communicate secretly without their respective partners finding out. The two had also attended the same Narcotics Anonymous groups twice a week, so they saw each other at these meetings, and then they also went on dates or hookups twice a week. They would often go shopping together with Damien one time saying that Donna had a shopping problem. They contacted each other via phone in text messages or calls and voicemails dozens of times per day. Damien went on to say that he knew that Donna was still married and she knew that he continued dealing drugs as they went on about their relationship. However, their secret affair wouldn't remain a secret for too long, so Donna had actually left Damien a voicemail and Charlene heard it and she actually kicked him out of the apartment that they shared together. He ended up getting his own place after that and at the new apartment, Donna paid his rent and his cable and his electric bill. Bill. At the same time, Charlene did also continue to date Damien. Then, by December of 2004, Ghulam also found out about the relationship. It came out after Charlene had found out about the relationship and she had actually called Ghulam to let him know what was going on behind his back. Donna and Ghulam had talked about it and they seemed to come to a mutual agreement to get a divorce, but they wanted to wait until July of 2005. That way, their nephew, Farak, who was living with them and sort of saw them as parents, 
he could study for and take his medical boards exam without the stress of dealing with these two going through a divorce. At the same time that this was going on in late 2004, Donna's family started to learn about some of the concerning things that were going on in Donna and Gulam's lives. Now, none of them knew about the relationship between Donna and Damien. However, around that time, Donna had confided in her brother-in-law that she had found out that people were actually threatening Gulam. She also told him about scary phone calls that he was receiving that left him feeling really shaken up. By May of 2005, Gulam had told a colleague that he had been planning to head over to Toledo, Ohio so that he could visit his nephew who had been living there while attending medical school. Apparently, the colleague told Gulam to be careful because there's a lot of crime that happens in Toledo. At the same time, Donna had told her parole officer, Chris, that she actually feared for Gulam's safety in Toledo because he was known to carry around large wads of cash in his wallet. Either way, by Friday, May 13th, 2005, Gulam, Donna, as well as Donna's 74-year-old mother, Dorothy, set off in their champagne-colored Jaguar sports car towards Toledo. This would be around a three-hour and 20-minute drive from where they lived in Center Township, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. As they drove, they stopped along the Ohio Turnpike where they went into the Portage County Service Plaza to buy some sandwiches. After this, Donna took over driving and she drove for about a half hour until around 6.30 p.m. when she told Gulam that she wanted to switch back to him driving. To do this, they pulled onto the emergency pull-off area on the highway. As the two were getting out of the car though, another car pulled up behind them. A man had gotten out of his car and walked right up to Gulam. He held a gun to his head and demanded that he give up his wallet. Donna had the wallet in her purse, so she handed it over to Gulam, who then gave it to the man. But even after handing over the wallet, the man still decided to shoot Gulam point blank in the temple. After that, the man ran back to his car, which was a black van, and then drove off. Obviously, Donna and her mother were just in a complete panic and they didn't know what to do. So they flagged down a passing driver who called an emergency number that was listed on a sign nearby. In the phone call to the emergency operator, it seemed like a miscommunication had happened. Donna didn't really say what happened to the operator. She was kind of vague about it, but all they really knew was that there was a decent amount of blood at the crime scene. I heard in one article that the operator kind of understood that there was a no bleed or something going on so they didn't really have much information to go off of and it seemed that Donna was being very vague about the entire thing. So it was actually 24 minutes before paramedics arrived to the scene. When they got there though they saw a man laying on the ground absolutely covered in blood with a woman performing CPR on him and at that point she also was covered in blood. It wasn't until they actually inspected Gulam that they realized that he had actually been shot. When paramedics initially went to inspect him and provide him help, they actually had to physically remove Donna off of him because she was trying so hard to save his life. Of course, when police arrived to the scene, they interviewed Donna to figure out what had just happened. She told police that during their stop at the Portage Service Plaza, Gulam had opened his wallet to pay for the sandwiches, but he only had $50 bills in a wad of around $4,000 dollars, so he ended up paying for the sandwiches with a $50 bill. She told the officers that she had always warned Gulam against carrying so much cash in his wallet because this was something that he always did, and she was always concerned that someone would want to rob him. She said that after they pulled off onto the emergency pull-off, she didn't notice that anybody had stopped behind them. She said that as they were getting out of the car to switch seats, someone ran up to them and was screaming at Gulam to give over his wallet. But she said that she could not remember what this man looked like. 
All she knew was that he was short, standing between five foot two and five foot four, and he was dressed in all black. He had a mean voice, and he had driven a black van. Throughout these initial interviews, and pretty much any interview that followed, she seemed absolutely hysterical. At this time, both her and Dorothy were just shaking and crying, and they could barely get out the words to explain to police what they had just witnessed. They repeatedly shouted, shouted to the paramedics and police, do something, we need help, please do something. At first, police just saw this as a random attack that Gulam was carrying all of this cash. He pulled it out when he was paying for the sandwiches. Somebody saw it and then followed him and took his wallet. However, what didn't make sense was why was he shot even after handing over his wallet? If it was just a robbery, why take the risk of shooting somebody in broad daylight right in front of two witnesses? Then witnesses started coming forward to police about a week after the shooting. First was Donna's parole officer, Chris Sauter. Chris thought that it was weird that just before they left for Toledo, Donna was telling him that she was worried for Gulam's safety. It's like she almost predicted that something bad was going to happen to him. He also told investigators about how Gulam had apparently been getting these scary, threatening phone calls right before he was shot. So, all of a sudden, this shooting was looking to be less random. So, investigators started looking more into the vehicle movement of Donna and others on the highway around the area that day. They found that Donna, Gulam, and Dorothy had entered the Ohio Turnpike at 5.09 p.m. They found that a car had entered the Ohio Turnpike right behind them at around the same time and then left the closest exit to the murder scene at 6.34 p.m. right after 911 had received a call. So, it looked to them like they had been followed. Then, another witness came forward to police to tell them about the affair between Donna and Damien, but it wasn't just an affair. It was more than that. She was spending thousands of dollars on him and was showering him with gifts. She texted him all throughout the day, every day, and she was very much attached to him. So, after finding all of this information out, police were able to get a search warrant for Damien's apartment, and immediately, they had found 19 $50 bills as well as a vial of steroids that they believed had been stolen from Gulan's office. In addition to this, they found two cell phones, both of which belonged to Damien. Using the phones, they were able to look at his text messages as well as track his phone's location and compare them to Gulam's cell phone's locations. So, they found that on May 13th, 2005 in the morning, both Damien and Donna's phones had been traveling in the direction that met in between where their respective homes were. Then, later in the afternoon, Damien's cell phone had pinged back at his apartment until he started traveling north until it reached a tower in Hermitage, Pennsylvania, which is where the Mundas lived. At this time, Damien was near Gulam's home and Donna had texted him saying, I'm gonna get something to drink before I go, and then another text saying, enjoy the beautiful day. I will text you when I can. I love you. These text messages, as well as him being near their home, was right before Donna, Gulam, and Dorothy had left their home to head towards Ohio. After this, it showed that Damien's cell phone had started to head towards Ohio at the same time that Gulam's phone was heading towards Ohio. By 6.04 p.m., Damien's phone had pinged at a tower closest to the Portage Service Plaza at the same time that the Mundas were seen on surveillance video purchasing snacks there. I also want to note that on the surveillance video, they also saw that Donna was in possession of Gulam's wallet that entire time and was paying for their purchases that entire time. So, if anybody saw the money coming out of the wallet, it was in Donna's possession. By 6.29 p.m., Damien's phone had pinged off of a tower that was less than a mile away from the murder scene. Then, by 7.09 p.m., the phone started pinging at the service plaza once again. Then, after this, his phone started pinging in Pennsylvania until, eventually, it reached his home. Their phones also showed that on the night of the murder, Donna had texted Damien saying, something terrible has happened. I don't know where to start. I can't talk right now. Maybe later. 
Altogether, the entire day of the murder, investigators found that Donna and Damien had communicated 23 times, 8 times through phone calls, and then 15 times through text messages. Also, throughout the investigation, police had discovered Gulam's wallet, his business cards, his credit cards, as well as his driver's license scattered along different areas along the shoulders and medians going eastbound away from Ohio into Pennsylvania, so the same direction that that Damien would have been driving. Also at the crime scene, investigators found shell casings that belonged to a 9mm gun. Then more witnesses came forward to police to talk about the relationship between Donna and Damien as well as the relationship between Donna and Gulam. Again, we know that Gulam and Donna had talked about getting a divorce after he found out about the affair. It turned out that Donna had actually signed a prenup when they got married. In this agreement, Donna was entitled to $250,000 if they got divorced. But investigators found out that if Gulam died, she would be the one to get his insurance policy, which would pay her $700,000. She would also be getting a large portion of his estate, which was worth two to $3 million. So it was starting to look like Donna may have had quite the motive for her husband's death, and it seemed like she'd probably asked Damien to carry it out for her, but at this time, they didn't have any concrete evidence to go off of. When they questioned Donna, Donna was under the impression that, you know, they thought that Damien was the one who shot Ghulam, but she didn't get the idea yet that they thought that she was the one who told him to. So, when they questioned her, she told police that Damien is much taller than the man who she saw shoot her husband, so there was no way that Damien could have been the one involved. She said that yes, her and Ghulam were planning a divorce, but the entire thing was amicable and things were going just fine. So, police booked Damien in jail on the steroid charges because again, they didn't have really any evidence to book him on any murder charges, and as he awaited trial in jail, they listened to his jail phone calls. But this pretty much just led them to more roadblocks. First of all, all of the conversations between Damien and Donna, as well as Damien and Charlene, were just romantic and saying that they loved each other. Then, when police went to question Charlene, she actually said that Damien could not have been the shooter because he was actually with her on the night of the murder. However, after police looked into both her and Damien's cell phone records, it showed that Charlene was clearly lying. She was in Pennsylvania that day, while Damien was obviously on the Ohio Turnpike, so she admitted that she was lying, and she said that she was not with Damien that night. She also told police that things between Donna and Ghulam actually were not very good. They were actually pretty nasty and they were going through a lot. Now, the original plan that they had come up with for Donna if Damien ever got caught was that she was going to claim that he was innocent and that she was going to testify that at trial. But Donna actually changed her mind and she no longer wanted to help Damien maintain his innocence. So, knowing how much circumstantial evidence was against him, Damien actually took a plea deal. So, he told investigators everything and led them to exactly where he had dumped the murder weapon. So Damien told police about how he had met Donna and then the nature of their relationship. It seemed like Donna really liked the attention that she was getting from Damien and Damien loved all of the money that Donna was spending on him. So once Ghulam found out about the affair, he obviously wanted a divorce and actually Ghulam offered Donna $1 million to just have an amicable split, which is actually four times the amount that she was promised in the prenup, but this wasn't enough for her. Damien said that he actually urged Donna to take the million dollars, but said that she wanted to get what she deserved, what was owed to her, which to her was a lot more than just a measly $1 million. So the agreement was, was that Damien was going to kill Ghulam and then she was going to get his millions of dollars and then she said that Damien could have half of it. He was under the impression that the amount that he was going to get was going to be between three and six million dollars. 
he said that this amount of money sounded pretty amazing to a young black kid who was struggling. He said that using all of this money, he could take care of his mother and his brothers, but he said at first he wasn't the one who was willing to pull the trigger. He wanted somebody else to do it. All of this just sounded way too good to be true. This was until Donna came back to him with the entire thing plotted out. The original plan was actually to follow Ghulam to the mosque where he worshipped in Youngstown and then shoot him outside of the building. So, Damien said that it actually did start following around Ghulam and waited for an opportunity, but that opportunity never came. Then he said after this, he followed Ghulam to his office in Hermitage but he got directions from Donna to actually come over to the home that she shared with Ghulam. When he got there, they talked, they hooked up, and at this time, they came up with a new plan. She said that he should just kill Ghulam when he came home that day, but they ultimately decided against it because they were afraid that the neighbors would be able to identify Damien and get him in trouble for it. This is when they started to talk about her upcoming trip to Toledo. She came up with a plan to kill Ghulam and make it look like a robbery gone wrong as they were driving up to Toledo. She said that she was going to make it obvious to the cameras, to witnesses, to everybody that Ghulam had always carried large amounts of money in his wallet. That way, it would make sense that somebody would have seen the money and want to rob him. Remember, she was the one who had his wallet at the Plaza service station, so she was the one that was taking the wads out, going through the wad, and flashing around these 50s. She wanted to make sure that somebody saw it, that when police looked at the surveillance video, that they would see this huge wad of money sticking out and that, you know, it would be obvious that somebody clearly saw it and somebody obviously wanted to rob him. They talked about where they were going to pull over and they said that they wanted to make sure that it was a very busy area of the Ohio Turnpike to make sure that others would see it and others would see it as a robbery gone wrong. Then Donna came up with the idea to drag poor Dorothy along with them to make it look more like a random attack. She would be an unbiased person who could testify to what she saw and make it less suspecting on Donna. Then Donna actually asked Damien to also shoot her, only giving her a flesh wound, but he was completely against the idea and obviously ended up not shooting her. So, here is the plan that they ended up following through with. On the morning of May 13th, Donna texted Damien saying that she had something to give him. The two met in Maveria, which is between their respective homes. This is what we saw earlier on the cell phone records where their phones pinged in an area that was about right in the middle of where their homes are located. At this time when they met up, that is when she gave him MapQuest directions to Toledo. After this, Damien went back to his own apartment where he dressed in all black and then drove back to a store near the Munda's home. This is where Donna sent Damien to dummy texts to alert Damien that they were about to leave. These texts were the ones that I discussed earlier where she told him that she was going to be getting something to drink and then another text saying to enjoy the beautiful day and saying that she loves him. Once their champagne-colored Jaguar sports car passed the parking lot where Damien was waiting, he pulled out onto the street and started following them. Once they got onto the Ohio Turnpike, once again, they went to the service plaza to buy their sandwiches. Before they went inside, Damien says that Donna turned around and looked directly at Damien. As they were all inside, Damien waited inside of his car in the parking lot. Once they got back into the car, as we know, Donna took over driving so that she could control where exactly it was that they would pull over. Again, after about a half hour of driving, that's when Donna pulled over onto the emergency shoulder on the Ohio Turnpike. Once they pulled over, that was Damien's signal to also pull over. This was when he got out of the car and then ran straight up to Ghulam, took his wallet, and ran away. As Damien drove back to Pennsylvania, he took the nearest exit and he started throwing out any personal items that could identify Ghulam out of the window, hence finding his license, credit cards, and a wallet scattered all along the way. 
but obviously he did keep the wad of cash that was in the wallet again which makes sense why there was 19 50 bills found in damien's apartment then damien led police to where he discarded the nine millimeter handgun that was used in the murder it was located less than a mile away from the murder site and upon investigation, the gun matched the 9mm shell casing that they had found at the scene. He said that that day, after shooting Dr. Munda, he had called some friends to make some drug deals, and then he went out to get something to eat, and then he went to a Narcotics Anonymous meeting. All of this, he said, was to just get his mind off of what had just happened. Then, as we know, Donna texted Damien afterwards, acting surprised that her husband was killed, but Damien chose not to respond to this. After the shooting, the two actually didn't have that much contact, but he did go over to her home during December for Christmas time. At that time, he spent a couple of days there. The two hooked up, they drank, and she actually gave him several pieces of Louis Vuitton luggage. After that, him and Donna had plans to move in somewhere together and just live happily ever after. But that isn't really what Damien had wanted. He actually wanted to live with her for a short period of time and then take off with all of the money. Then at some point, Donna decided not to be the star witness at the murder trial that would have inevitably happened for Damien. So he turned on her and spilled all of the tea. So Damien signed a plea deal. He would get a 17 and a half year prison sentence if he testified in trial against Donna, and he did. So the trial started in June of 2007. Donna was being charged with one count of interstate stalking resulting in death, one count of murder for hire, and two counts of using a firearm during a violent crime resulting in death. So of course, in trial, Damien testified testified to everything that we had just discussed, and he actually testified for five hours. He said that after the murder, the money started to run low. He said that Donna continued giving him, you know, two to three thousand dollars, but after that, she didn't really have much more money to live off of. It probably took a lot longer than they expected to actually get a payout for all of this, so she seemed to be just running through the money and not really thinking much about it. Of course, Damien talked about the motive, the plan that they carried out, and everything. The prosecution also showed all of the cell phone tower pings, the text messages between the two of them, and then all of the evidence that they found in Damien's apartment. Donna's lawyer did their best to discredit anything that Damien said. They pointed out that he had lied under oath before. They said that he was a violent person and Donna was never known to be a violent person. Yes, she had her issues with drugs in the past, but other than that, she wasn't known to do anything harmful towards anybody. They also brought forward all of the witnesses who said that Donna and Gulam had a wonderful marriage and Donna wasn't in it for the money at all. They said that Donna did not plan this. They more so made it look like Damien was a jealous boyfriend who just wanted Donna all to himself. But Damien came back to say that he had several girlfriends. Donna was not the only female that he was in love with. He said that he had planned to take the money and run after the murder, so he did not kill Ghulam on his own accord, just based off of how much he wanted Donna. The jury ended up siding with the prosecution and the evidence that they presented. By the end of Donna's trial, by July 6, 2007, she was found guilty on all counts. She was sentenced to life in prison for the murder for hire charge and then 360 months on all three other counts. She did try to overturn the conviction multiple times, but as it stands now, she is still sitting in jail. For the years that followed, Donna and Damien sat in jail. However, in December of 2020, after serving 15 years behind bars, 
Damien was released. And at this time, at first, we didn't hear too much about Damien until July of this year. On July 29th of 2022, two state troopers in Aliquippa were on patrol when they observed a disturbance happening outside of a Franklin Mini Mart. Turned out, a man had run up and confronted several people as they were entering into the store. He held a gun at them and started threatening these people as they were trying to get into the store. He followed them in and chased them, continuing to threaten them. And then one of the men went back outside and the gunmen followed and they confronted each other once again. This is when police arrived on the scene and they confronted the gunman. And as you can probably guess by now, the gunman was Damien Bradford. By this time, Damien had ran back into the store to escape police but the troopers had caught up with him. And when they did so, Damien actually started shooting at the officers and he shot one of them in the leg. After this, another officer who had arrived on scene was able to subdue Damien and get him in handcuffs. At the time that I researched and recorded this case, which is early August, I don't know the condition of the police officer, but because of this entire situation, Damien was charged with attempted homicide, aggravated assault, prohibited possession of a firearm, assault of a law enforcement officer, and attempting to disarm a law enforcement officer, and he is back in jail. So clearly, he didn't learn from his 15 years behind bars, and he pretty much went exactly back to where he was, and that's genuinely disappointing. I would hope that by spending that much time in jail that something about you would change, but it didn't. So it's unfortunate, but I guess he's back in jail now. But either way, that is where the case stands today. Obviously, Dr. Munda did not deserve any of this. He seemed like a wonderful doctor who cared so much about his patients. This is just such a strange case to me because it didn't even seem like Donna and Damien even had that great of a relationship. Maybe Damien liked or loved Donna a lot more than he let on, but to me, it seemed like he didn't care all that much about her. So I think for Donna, she was just drawn into this exciting life with this exciting person, and she wanted to be able to be the one who could spoil her lover. And Damien, obviously, I think he was in it all for the money. I think right away she started showering him with gifts and I feel like that was her way of showing him love and affection and that was the best way that she knew and she wanted him to stick around so she made sure that he did by giving him all of this money and then Damien was just taking it. He's like, cool, I get all this money. That's awesome. And you know, he wanted to stick around because of that. And then he saw an opportunity to get even more money. And Donna just wanted her husband out of the way so that she could spend her life with Damien. And then this happened. It's all just so senseless because Donna literally could have made it out with a million dollars and a free life. But instead, she chose to rip Gulam's life away from him and his loved ones. She destroyed an entire family, which I'm sure with all of them living all the way in India, I'm sure all of this was just a nightmare for them. But either way, as always, my heart goes out to Ghulam and his family, and I'm really glad that Donna is behind bars. I'm angry that Damien was able to get out after killing somebody just to go out and clearly hurt somebody else again, but Hopefully, he stays in jail for a very long time after this. But either way, that is all I have for today's video. And now I want to know what you all think. Do you think that this was all Damien's doing? Or do you think that Donna truly did come up with this plot to kill her husband for financial gain and to go off with her lover? Let's discuss that and any other thoughts you may have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you head to hellofresh.com and use code RACHELSHANNON16 to get your 16 free meals across seven boxes plus three free gifts. Don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. 
with that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.